Right. So we'll get we'll get going. There'll just be me talking as an introduction for a few minutes. So there's, you know, if, if there are a few stragglers, uh, they won't miss anything. Uh, good evening, everybody. You're very welcome on this dark and stormy night. Uh, we hope uh, uh, all is well in your area, wherever wherever you are. Uh, we're very lucky that uh, Alan uh, is is with us this evening, uh, in the, sort of coming from the southwest, where you know the the, uh, the the main force of the storm has has hit today. Uh, thankfully, no no particular uh, uh, communication problem there. And our webinar this evening is going to be about white-tailed eagles, uh, which is really, really exciting. And, and I think we've got a phenomenal uh, number of people who are reg registered uh, to hear this talk this evening, which just goes to show um, the, uh, the level of interest in these particular birds, uh, 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 which is ongoing uh, since their reintroduction. Uh, before we get started, and before I introduce you uh, formally to, uh, to Alan, uh, just to welcome you to the Irish Wildlife of Trust uh, webinar series, which we have been holding now for over a year. We've been having more or less monthly uh, webinars. Uh, they're all recorded. They're all available uh, on our website. You can look back. We've been uh, Looking across a very uh, a diverse range of issues uh, from climate change and uh, species conservation and farming and rewilding and uh, lots of different things. So make sure to check out our website uh, to look at uh, some of those past uh, webinars. Um, and uh, if anyone you know is interested in this and uh, would like to watch it afterwards, you can tell them that a recording will be available towards the end of this week and we'll post it onto our social media as usual. Uh, so um, I'm sure many of you will have questions uh, as we go along. So what I'm going to ask you to do, please, is to look at the bottom of your screen and you will see a Q&A button and to please put your question for Alan in the Q&A uh, button. Uh, you're free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat, but I won't be particularly monitoring the chat button. So questions for Alan in the Q&A. And finally, just to say that uh, the Irish Wildlife Trust is a national conservation charity. We've been on the go since 1979, quite a long time. And our, our mission is to raise awareness of uh, nature and wildlife and its important people. And of course, in more recent years, this has become all the more urgent as we find ourselves in the midst of a biodiversity crisis. Uh, so please do consider uh, supporting our work by joining the IWT. Uh, it's only 35 euro a year and you'll get our magazine. Um, and we try to keep events like this uh, free and open to as many people as possible. And once, uh, coronavirus restrictions and we'll get back to doing in-person events uh, as we had been before. So without further ado, we will get on to the main event uh, tonight and I'm really uh, excited and happy uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have Alan Mee along with us here, Dr. Alan Mee, uh, who is the project manager for the White-Tailed Eagle Project since 2007. Uh, so some of you will remember uh, the reintroduction of, uh, of the White-Tailed Eagles uh, back around that time, and uh, Alan will tell us more, but it was a really, really exciting time in Irish conservation. These are top predators. Uh, this was rewilding before rewilding really um, captured the public imagination. Um, and it'll be very interesting to hear from Alan how the birds have been doing uh, and the challenges they face and the opportunities that, uh, that, that lie ahead. Um, and Alan, before we hand over to you formally, can you clarify one thing for me, please? Are they white-tailed eagles or are they white-tailed sea eagles? Both. Both are good. So okay. depends what mood you're in. You can use both. But a lot of people, it's shortened white-tailed sea eagle to sea eagle. So okay. you often see sea eagle mentioned, which is obviously the shortened version. of. So, so you've got three different versions. Or you can go for the Irish version, Illawarra as well. Wonderful. Okay, <laughs> great. We cleared that up. Okay, uh, Alan, in your own time, uh, over to you. Thanks, Podrick. I'll share the screen there. Let's see if I can get it right. Okay. <clears throat> okay, hope you can all see that okay. Seeing you and uh, hearing you loud and clear. 
that's good 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 start yeah it's it is pretty stormy so i don't know if you can hear it raging in the background but uh hopefully it'll it, it won't cut us off yeah thanks for tuning in so i've titled this kind of thing from extinction and back white tail seagull reintroduction to ireland a saga of nature conservation politics and hopefully perseverance and it's it is a long-term project um and it's been managed by the golden eagle trust and in partnership with the, with the uh, national parks and wildlife service since 2007 and also our collaborators in nina in norway so uh, we'll come back to that at the end and talk about some of the other collaborators but so if i can move on i'm stuck Okay, so where it began. A brief, so I'm gonna do, I just broken down the talk here brief, into a few sections um, because time is reasonably short. I'm gonna skim through some of them. So by all means, if you wanna know more about any aspect, just drop a question and I'm sure Padraig will give it to me at the end. I'm gonna talk about a brief history of species extinction. Um, white tailed eagles and other species, white tailed eagles, sea eagle, population, demise and recovery in, in Europe and Asia, reintroduction, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, obviously, and uh, return of white tailed sea eagles to Ireland, the, uh, that's the bones of, the, of the, uh, the talk, talk about dispersal movement, settlement, breeding in the wild, uh, the various mortality factors which have hit us over the years, and reason, uh, what I termed reason, reasons to be cheerful. Um, you will probably recognize that if you are a old timer in jury and the Blockheads fan. So hopefully that'll, that'll cheer you up at the end. Um, so white tailed sea eagles, obviously, obviously we didn't have data go, uh, from 500, the year 500, um, but um, a paper that was published in 2012 by Evans and Alan Bird study, study looked at uh, the distribution of white-tailed eagles in Ireland and Britain um, between going back to that point, it was taken, 500 was used as a starting point really because it was the time, I guess, when you had Anglo-Saxon invasion in England and um, eagles were appearing appearing in in manuscripts for the first time, and obviously they they are well they are also documented to some extent the Celtic manuscripts as well. So they looked at all the place names that had uh, references to eagles in Britain and Ireland, and the dots in blue are ones they ascribe to white-tailed sea eagles, red golden eagle, and the black dots could be either. So these were the ranges basically of 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 these birds at the time um and they estimated from that uh, there were maybe 800 to 1400 pairs of white-tailed seagulls in britain and ireland at the time but um by 1800 um they that population had dropped to about 150 pairs so it was a pretty huge decline uh, obviously and you know over time tr tree felling and persecution would have had major impacts on, on the species. That's a white-tailed eagle on the top right and golden eagle on the bottom there. So quite distinctive. Um, so coming to Ireland, um, white-tailed eagles really uh, were found that on these, eventually, you know, this, this is, you're talking about 1750 to 1850, white-tailed eagles were mainly found in these more remote parts of Ireland. They would have once obviously been found throughout, certainly along the Shannon and various other places along Ireland, but I've just picked out some of these sites from the literature um, that we know of where birds were breeding at this time. And obviously, although the population had been greatly reduced, there were still a good breeding population uh, in some of these. Some of these areas were still good for the birds. So um, Thompson in Natural History of Ireland, 1849, talks about um, white-tailed eagles and hornhead. In winter, the sea eagle is comparatively numerous in in the hornhead area of Donegal, and that he has sometimes seen as many as six or seven in company on the strand. Talking about ackle, then we are informed that four pairs breed ackle. Uh, Connemara is common to at the district, has its area in cliffs rising from the sea and trees growing in small islands and inland lakes. Um, well, in 1807, uh, from Killarney, talks about eagles common on the small islands in the lower lake. 
particularly on ones which are bound with rabbits. And uh, from the Old Head of Kinsale, talks about sea eagle common on the cliffs on the seashore in the Old Head of Kinsale area. <clears throat> this isn't, this is, this is uh, Thompson again talking about Hornhead, but uh, I don't have a good photograph of Hornhead. So this is, you might recognize this as the Cliffs of Moor, where white-tailed eagles did also breed. So Thompson describes two nests from Hornhead, Donegal in 1832, one pair on eggs and another less than a furlong distant with two well-grown young. Now that's that's only a furlong is only 200 meters. So uh, we know from today um, that that is exceptionally close for two white tail eagles to breed. Um, usually you're talking about a minimum of a couple of kilometers. So that suggests you know that the certainly the food supply was was pretty good to be able to sustain those that both of those were breeding successfully at the time. Um, and above the nest are many legs of rabbits and remains of puffins. So we know they were feeding on seabirds quite a bit. You can see the photograph on the bottom is from Norway, but uh, they're quite social animals. So like the golden eagle, which uh, you know often solitary or uh, defend their territory as a pair, uh, certainly outside the breeding season in certain parts of Norway and young birds especially can be very, very social. So you can get uh, accumulations of birds while the feeding is good. Um, this is from Killarney. Um, this is Eagle's Nest from Killarney. So this is uh, Isaac Wells' um, scenery uh, of, of Killarney and surrounding area published in 1807. And he talks about on this part of the route, the only animals observed were eagles. We counted no less than 12 of them within easy gunshot reach. That might, might sound pretty... Um, uh, dramatic, but uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the eagles were being shot at. Um, uh, Victorians often um, talked about uh, they, they, you know, often they didn't have binoculars, so they talked about uh, eagles being far distance uh, by uh, whether they were within gunshot reach or not. So this is um, the, the same spot today. You can see it's very, very distinctive. Um, Probably more, you can see it's probably from that, uh, don't know how accurate that is, but it looks pretty accurate to me. Certainly the person who painted it knew it well, and it looks more wooded than the eagle's nest we have today. The remnants of the old native woodland. This is from um, a diary of the, the, from a, the administrator of a will of a South Kerry priest in 1824. Um, uh, walking into the uh, inn in Killarney and uh, seeing a large eagle chained with iron, the keeper told me that no dog, sheep or goat would be safe within his reach. It is a very powerful beak, legs and claws of a very dark grey species, certainly white tail eagle. Um, and a story is told of a person now living and in business in Killarney who was taken up when an infant from the field where its parents were employed at harvest time and carried a considerable distance till being observed by some peasants where he alighted. They attacked him and recovered the infant who still bears the marks of his talons in his side. So um, probably a pretty tall tale. And certainly the, these tales of eagles flying off with children are pretty widespread, really, um, not just for white tailed eagles, but for lots of other eagle species throughout the world. And um, the little bit at the bottom I have uh, on June the 5th, 1932, Svanhild Hansen, four-year-old girl in Norway, uh, was grabbed apparently grabbed by the back of her dress by a white illegal which flew with her to its eyrie. The eyrie was 800 meters uh, up the side of a nearby mountain about 1.6 kilometers away in flying distance. So she actually only died in uh, 2010 um, but um, in, in certainly in her latter years uh, wasn't really talking about this and so uh, whether it, it it certainly it could not really have happened the way it was described because white tail eagles really could not carry a child it's far too big but you can see that the that uh that story has has popped up to our time so white tail eagles back to them in ireland where the they these are some of the dates really i could pick out from the literature where white tail eagles dis disappear one by one from these sites um so the last stand that's uh, Hornhead and Arnmore, about 1880, Ackle 1892 to 98, 
the Moran Mountains before 1831, Connemara sometime after 1841, Loch Bray and Wicklow, 1832, the Blaskets before 1880, the Cumberland Mountains and Waterford, 1864, and the Bearer Peninsula, 1894. And this is believed to be the last site where White Elite is bred in Ireland. The North Mayo Coast, North Mayo Cliffs, and um, Port Cloy. And this is um, taken from Sean Lysett's book, uh, Eagle Country. The species bred successfully here for at least six years up to 1909. Uh, the nest had been robbed previously at a nearby site. Usher was unable to prove breeding when he visited in 1910. The site was presumably the last in Mayo to hold breeding sea eagles. So, um, and you can see the little map of Ireland on the site. These are sites taken from Gordon Darcy's book, um, Ireland's Lost Birds, and here's the site in North Mayo. So causes of extinction, uh, white tailed eagles ex became extinct in 1909. There were one of at least seven raptor species lost to Ireland between the 18th and 20th century, including golden eagle, goshawk, osprey, red kite, buzzards, and marsh harrier, mainly due to human persecution. So collecting a good Victorian pastime, unfortunately, had a, would have had a, a quite an impact. Um, here's a, again taken from Thompson, 1849. The writer had visited 14 eagle nests in Connemara and robbed several of the eggs. Um, shooting of the number uh, of the number 13 or 14 eagles killed at the horn, horn head. Within four years, all but one individual were Halliers albacillas, white-tailed eagle. So you can imagine 13 or 14 birds killed within four years. That's that's a huge amount. It's going to have a certainly serious toll. Um, but probably for a white allele, especially, poison was probably the biggest, maybe the coup de grace, the biggest killer. Gamekeepers with guns and poison decided the fate of eagles in Ireland. The partiality of this species for carrion precluded any hope of its survival. So they're pretty grim. Uh, picture, but the late 20th century we've seen recovery and recolonization, expansion in raptor populations, golden eagle and red kite reintroduced, common buzzard and north, northern goshawk re-establishing, and marsh harrier and ospreys may recolonize. So that balance, hopefully we're balancing out some of those earlier losses. So this is this is the range of white tail eagle in Europe, certainly in yellow and green. Um, and this uh, white tail eagles declined hugely in uh, Europe. Um, you can see the the, uh, the the graph on the bottom left here is Finland from 1970 up to into the 2000s. So you can see the population recovering, and the main reason for uh, the population crash throughout much of Europe was uh, DDT, um, much like you might be aware of the crash from peregrine falcons. So DDT obviously impacted their reproductive success. You can see the bird on the left here with the unhatched egg. This would have been typical and many nests failed, didn't produce any chicks whatsoever. And mainly through the effects of DDT on an eggshell thinning. And with the banning of DDT in the 70s, you can see the, the graph on the, see on the right hand side, you'll see the productivity of white tail eagles recovering and it took about maybe 15 20 years to recover properly up to its former level and it's amazing how the populations have recovered since reintroduction as a conservation tool uh, i'm just going to skip to this because for time reasons um but uh reintroduction of the int intentional movement and release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it had disappeared so Key considerations, is it, is it justified? Uh, are reasons for the extinction eliminated or reduced? Uh, then planning, feasibility and design, res, re, release site selection, all imp really important. Obviously reporting as the um, reintroduction goes on and then documenting or measuring whether the reintroduction is a success or failure. Is the population secure? So these are all important. And these are some of the species for which reintroduction has been really, really important in really saving them from extinction, not just local extinction. So here, California condor, which um, I was lucky to spend five years in uh, 20, uh, started, starting actually 20 years ago, uh, working on the California condor in California and Arizona. So 
saved really through reintroduction and now recovering in the wild bearded vulture in Europe and uh, this the largest uh, flightless parrot in the world, the kakapo. So the, again, range of uh, white tailed eagles, very broad from uh, Siberia in the east to Greenland in the west. You'll see population in Greenland and isolated population there in Iceland as well. A range overlaps with another sea, another eagle, sea eagle, stellar sea eagles, which is even bigger, one of the biggest eagles in the world. You see the uh, white tailed eagles in flight here, and they look reasonably puny compared to those uh, amazing stellar sea eagles mainly found in Japan and the Kamchatka Peninsula, Siberia. Uh, white, white tailed eagles have been successfully reintroduced to the Western Scotland, Eastern Scotland, now in Southern England, and now over 130 pairs now established in um, Northern Scotland. And there's our founder population in uh, Norway. And there's also an ongoing reintroduction in Asturias in Northern Spain uh, starting this year. And the world population is about um, 25 to 50,000 adult birds, 12 to nine to 12 and a half thousand pairs in Europe. And it's a very large eagle, one, uh, one of the largest eagles in the world, similar ecology to bald eagle, fish eating, long-term pair bonds. Um, this is an adult uh, plumage of the pair, so it's very, sex is very similar but um, they're sexually dimorphic with females being quite a lot bigger, significantly bigger than males, uh, weigh as much as 43% heavier than males and have a wingspan of about uh, two to 2.5 meters, up to eight foot no money. So this is, you can see how distinctive the adult is from, from a young bird. This is a second year bird with quite a mottled plumage, a much chocolatey brown in the first year, often described as a flying barn door because uh, you often don't see that, see the tail, and you'll see a pair of wings. So the found the population, Norway, good. We went to Norway really because they have a good population, two and a half, three thousand pairs. Good productivity is stable or increasing population, and they've had a long history of modeling of population monitoring. So this is a typical uh, view in northern Norway. Um, some of the sites we collected birds and these outer islands and skerries more typically well forested um, areas and fjord land. Um, so this is some of the offshore islands we collected had uh, were largely treeless and the, and the birds nested on the ground where there were no actually ground predators. But this is more typical view of a nest, big stick nest or a fjord. Uh, so this is the site in Killarney um, where they were held for uh, five to eight weeks held in these cages, a, a remote location, um, isolated from human contact as much as possible before they were released. So it'll be as wild as possible. And what did they do when, when they were released? So releases from 2007 to 2011, 100 birds, all birds wing tagged, had radio tags or GPS transmitters. Um, and you can see from the, you can see the birds on the left with a wing tag, so you can also read the tags in flight from the which, which yielded a lot of data. Um, a lot of people don't like those tags on the birds, but they're really invaluable for what they tell us once they move away from the site in Killarney, especially when the radios stop working after a few years. And this is what the birds did. This, so typically, um, this is one of the release birds. Um, they stay close to the release area for the first maybe four, five, uh, six months even, and uh, before they disperse away, and often come back in the following uh, late late summer, early autumn, and just before dispersing again. Um, and this is a wildbred bird which dispersed quite a bit earlier uh, from the nest area, didn't return, but one little return. Um, maybe so that's what you're talking about three years later and left again. So, and these are this is the bird, this is that same bird here that dispersed up to the north of Ireland, uh, returned back towards the release site and dispersed away again. So, you can see that they explore a huge amount of, of Ireland, really. Um, 
when we looked at the population as a whole, uh, with the satellite tag birds, we can get really, really good data from from and compare what the release birds do and, and the wild birds do, and also look for differences between males and females. So the female is the red line, the male is the blue line, and this is the mean of, uh, of all those birds. So you can see the females on average are uh, dispersing further away but uh, when, when you get to their maybe third or fourth year, they're coming back nearer the natal site than the males, which is kind of interesting. And these are, this was the release birds and the wild bred birds are starting to do something different. Although we, this, 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 this one here is only actually from three wild birds. Uh, the males are only three and seven females, three males, satellite tags. So it's quite a small sample, but it looks like there's something different going on here, but certainly again, the males remaining closer to the release site. So, um, so I've got a couple of animations that um, you know, Alan McCarthy uh, did for me. So I'm gonna play, this one is a, a bird that was released in Killarney in 2008. You can see this bird moving around. So this is, it, this is the following year, 2009, April, May, June, July, heads up to Orkney, back to Cape Roth, where I spent the summer in the northwest of Scotland, back to Killarney, just arrived back for Christmas, and then was likely heading back up to Scotland again, but actually it uh, transmitter stopped working here, unfortunately. The only one that did um, ever stop working. So we... But we know after that, a year after that, the bird actually returned to um, Southwest Ireland and within a couple of years, it was paired up and breeding. And this is a bird that would fledged from a nest in 2018 in Connemara. So it's starting to move around. This is uh, getting into early 2019 now, March, April, May, headed across the north of England, spent the summer in the north of England then headed back to the, to the Isle of Man for Christmas before returning to Ireland. And it's now in North Mayo. So uh, yeah, this bird when it turned up on the Isle of Man was the first bird, first white tail eagle on the Isle of Man since 1930. So it, it, was, it was quite, quite amazing. So where these birds, uh, what are these, where are these, where are the birds breeding? By the fourth, third or fourth calendar year, birds are establishing territories, potential breeding sites. Birds are turned to breed south and southwest of the release site in the main. So these are the breeding sites here on the map uh, at the moment. Um, these large blue circles, about uh, 10 pairs breeding. We've had up to 14 territorial pairs. Most birds settle within 50 kilometers of the release site to breed. Um, these males and females, and then we have another cohort, which would really these birds over here that settled 120 to 160 kilometers away. And these birds here, um, so we're talking about home range. Uh, this is a bird uh, that's breeding in Loch Derg. So with the satellite tags, we can look quite a bit at, at the uh, home range of the birds and see see how they're behaving really and uh, how they how they compare with birds in the wild in elsewhere in Europe where there's been quite a lot of studies in Norway the home range is estimated to be six to nine kilometers squares and home range size is often density dependent related to territory quality quality such as food and nest sites um, in Germany, home ranges vary from 2.4, small home ranges up to 12 kilometers uh, square. And, and so here in Ireland, the year on home range of this female is satellite tagged on Loch Derg is about 87 kilometers. But during the breeding season on the right hand side, her, her, her range is really contracts to around the, the, uh, the nest area. So down to 2.8 kilometers square or so. So, but um, they, another thing to be aware of here, of course, is they're, pro they're possibly using a much larger range area here because they're not in competition with uh, many more breeding birds. 
So as far as breeding is concerned, uh, birds start to breed at about five years as the males, breeding slightly, on average, slightly younger than the females, 5.25, 5.28 for males. Um, and we also to compare those with the Scottish population, and you can see the productivity, fledged brood size at the moment. So we're hitting uh, below what they did in Scotland in their first and second releases. Um, it was it, it, it has come down in the last couple of years, mainly due to a couple of events, which I'll talk about now. Um, so, but uh, so eight to ten pairs breeding annually, thirty four young fledged to date, breeding success mean of zero point three three young per territorial pair, one point two fledged young per successful nest. So a little bit lower in the Scottish population. So you can see the um, bird started pair here in these green the green bars up starting in twenty ten, first breeding in twenty twelve, first successful breeding in twenty thirteen. So we started to get up to seven young a year in 2016, 2017. And then we took a little bit of a dive in 2018. And that was related to the loss, unfortunately, of our two best breeding females on Loch Derg to avian influenza in 2018. And that really knocked back the population. Um, and we're kind of only recovering from it now. Um, now that 2020, we had a new breeding female in, on Loch Derg, and that has certainly helped. In 2019, we had a near wipeout. Um, and this has mainly been due to uh, kind of late spring storms. So, uh, and also early breeding attempts have included a number of trios, which depressed breeding success. Um, so summary about breeding, really restoring a top avian predator scavenger requires long-term commitment. Reestablishment uh, is threatened mainly by anthropogenic factors such as poisoning and also new threats such as avian influenza impacting population viability uh, as i mentioned late spring storms have impacted breeding success in the last three years uh, annual survivorship um certainly has been it's been decent enough um but with higher mortality for some reason in adult females not totally sure why that is um possibly related to interspecific mortality and i'll just come to that in a moment and also all the three birds we lost in 2018 to avian influenza were females. Whether those females are scavenging or taking more bird prey, and then females are more prone to avian influenza, or this is just a chance effect, we're not totally sure. Um, and see, these are some of the mortality factors here. So uh, poisoning being the biggest by far. Um, and here's the, the population on the right hand side. Is where we are the minimum and maximum population so the the, the true population is probably closer to here um but we also have these young birds that are now old enough to start joining the breeding population so we hope that this curve is going to come up as more and more young birds reach breeding age because we are really had our first um a first cohort of young birds to join the breeding population from 2014 on uh, so they're not those birds are now six, five, six years of age. So we hope that they will really, really boost the the breeding population. So mortality, poisoning was poisoning, as I mentioned, was the biggest factor, and poisoning was banned in 2010. Last confirmed poisoning was in 2015. Uh, but turnover in the adult breed population uh, with losses some adults has di disrupted breeding success and population stability. And uh, one male, we've one male unpaired since 2015 following mate death. Um, so here you can see um, these birds here. This is, this is, this is uh, birds recovered dead in blue and the poison birds in this kind of orange. Um, so last confirmed poisoning was in 2015. And that was this bird actually here. Um, this female sadly found dead on the nest in Connemara um, by a Dermot Breen and Ranger in Connemara. And you can see this when this bird was taken for post mortem, she um, actually had uh, a formed egg inside her. So she was just about to lay and they'd, they'd bred the previous year. And <clears throat> once, once she, she died, uh, her mate. 
how a mate disappeared. He he was sadly tagged. He's known as Star. You might be aware of that bird if you'd followed white tailed eagles over the year. And he dispersed all over Ireland, really, and never never repaired after losing her. And so it just goes to show the loss of individual birds kind of a huge impact on on the breeding population. Uh, we haven't had any confirmed poisonings, but we've had suspected poisoning since. So. It's not always possible to determine the cause of death if you don't get if you don't recover birds soon enough. Um, they decompose, so it can be hard to. And also, it's hard to test for everything that might kill a bird. Uh, a poisoning, so poisoning would have been suspected in some of those cases. But that fifty-eight percent poisoning, you know, if you took that out of the equation, really the survivorship of the birds would be pretty good all those other factors wouldn't have a major impact on the population, including uh, this is um, avian influenza up here. The three birds were lost to avian influenza. And in fact, there was another bird lost. You may have heard this winter to avian influ influenza from the new release cohort, which I'm not really discussing tonight, but you can certainly ask me about it. Um, and the other are turbine collisions. So things like shooting, haven't been a major factor. Two birds have been shot, one up in Loch Ney, and unfortunately, one of our first ever fledged young from Mount, from the nest in Mount Shannon in Loch Derg was shot the following year, 2014. So the major major losses really have been to poisoning in this area, poisoning up in Donegal as well, um, and also in uh, in Mayo as well. So it has been certainly been problematic. Uh, as I mentioned there, turbine strikes, we had three birds killed in, in 2012, 2011, 2012 to, to turbine strikes. This is a wind turbine on the island of Smola in Norway. And this is a map on the left showing the turbines on Smola, 60 odd turbines, which were unfortunately built against the best advice really of ecologists on the one well, of the densest population of white tailed seals in Norway. And to date, um, uh, the number of dead birds since the since Smaller came, went into operation in 2014 has now passed over 100 white tailed eagles killed uh, and, uh, by, by the, this one wind farm. Um, and yeah, so it's been very problematic. So the, the, uh, the population is still very strong now on smaller, but the, the breeding success has, and breeding has collapsed within the wind farm itself. So really, this is, that's a worst case scenario, uh, citing a wind farm on the densest population of white tail eagles. And certainly citing is a huge issue. Renewables are obviously important. This is a wind farm in Ireland. This is some of the some of the observations we did on the site, and this is probably, I think this is just within uh, uh, this one farm, one farm within a couple of months of flight lines of eagles and those black dots of turbines. And this is one of the, the first, this was the first white tail eagle covered dead in Ireland to a wind turbine. And you can see its wing had been completely severed. So uh, since then we haven't recovered any birds, not to say it hasn't happened because um, not every bird is tagged or, or satellite tagged. In fact, uh, you know, uh, less, than, less than half of the wild birds out there are wild bred birds are satellite tagged. Um, and all the, all the existing um, release birds do not have functioning radio tags. Other important sources of mortality. Well, this was, we've only had one. But I put this in there. It was pretty amazing. This 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 female had been a breeding female, um, so you can see the size of the bird. Um, and when we discovered, when we found it, kind of suspected it could be poisoning. But when we found the bird, we could see all these lacerations around the head. And um, once we did the post mortem, uh, it was clear the bird had been killed by other another white tailed sea eagle. And within <laughs> its mate was sitting on eggs at the time. Um, and um, the, the male uh, sat for a week and hatched on its own without leaving and hatched the, hatched the eggs. 
and we did try and supply food for the male near the nest um but he did he never went to the food and unfortunately the chick died uh, so probably soon after hatching you know he had to feed and then there was no mate to change over take over brooding the chick and it died and within within a short time after that the the other another female was seen over the nest so we and and the the male eventually repaired with this other female and they've been breeding ever since so we believe the female killed uh the breeding female to to really take over the nest site so and this is an important source of mortality in norway and um, because the populations are so dense you either wait sit it out and wait to get a breeding attempt or you fight your way in and so we didn't weren't really expecting this to happen but it has happened in ireland and may happen again in the future. So as I mentioned, avian influenza, we had a death about a month ago. Um, this is some of the migratory pathway of duck coming into Europe. So this is a worrying time, especially to get, um, there's been quite a few cases. You may have been watching the news last night, uh, up at Lock, up in Belfast with mute swans in a really bad way, um, suffering from avian influenza, apparently. And this was our first white tail eagles, this is Shane O'Neill here, Golden Eagle Trust. And we'd recovered um, the first white tail sea eagle in Ireland, a juvenile at the end of Loch Derg, which turned out to be uh, positive. And then um, very, very shortly after that, the breeding female on uh, New Mount Shannon was found dead. Um, more or less below the nest site, also positive. The female on the other site also disappeared. We never found her up at the north end of Loch Derg, but we're convinced she had to die. She had to, she died of uh, avian influenza as well. And, but after all that bad news, we need some uh, cheering up. So who says three's a crowd? First Irish fledged, uh, tree of chicks and 54 nesting attempts and 27 fledged broods. This is a uh, three chicks, uh, three chick brood, which is really rare even in Norway. Um, so this is this was the site we were expecting two chicks. We didn't even realize there were three in the nest. Luckily, we brought enough rings and a satellite day for these chicks. So this was brilliant to see. And this this was the second brood of Caltra, a satellite tagged female, originally from the southern end of Loch Derg, fledged in 2014, who paired up with this male that had lost his mate to avian influenza. He, she paired up with him in 2020, reared two chicks in the first attempt in 2020 and three in 2021. So just shows the quality of the habitat probably in Loch Derg. You know, it's pretty much all fish, some birds coming in to, to the nest as well, but largely fish. So we need, you know, it, it kind of reinforces the idea that the Shannon system or ecosystem really is probably where we need to be as far as really bolstering the Irish population is concerned. So restoring a top avian predator and scavenger requires long term commitment. You know, there are a lot of factors that face uh, establishing a population, such as poisoning, new threats such as avian influenza, need for a critical mass and reintroduction. Post-release monitoring and recovery is really important, and also legislation, uh, follow-up and enforcement of the Wildlife Act. We need the adaptive creative response to eagle population recovery, use of political public sites to spread awareness and community involvement, such as in Mount Shannon, and this was in 20, uh, 2013 and 2014, we set a public site there, and it was hugely, hugely popular, you know, but in the first few months, I think we, over the summer, we had up to 10,000 people visit, uh, largely unpublicized. Shows you there is an appetite for ecotourism in Ireland. Um, and certainly it was a real hit with local school kids and even the toddlers. And it's critical to address perceptions, misconceptions regarding threats of white-tailed sea eagles to uh, livestock um they really need to be taken seriously um obviously this 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 is kind of funny one looking back at it from the irish farmers journal and back in the day good see irish lamb back at, back on the menu but we need to needed to 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 really take the concerns of farmers really on board and 
it was a long slog. It wasn't easy. You may remember the uh, protests in uh, Kerry Airport back in uh, 20, 2007 when the first birds arrived. But um, it, uh, you know, over time, we built up that relationship uh, with farmers and to such an extent now that uh, we have a couple of nests where farmers are, uh, watch the birds and report on how the birds are doing. So that's that's been really, really important. And that's that's my um, that's my little bell going off to tell me I have 40 minutes. So. Um, moving on here to there, it, so this is this is a headline, I guess, in from the Farming Independent in uh, twenty eighteen. Certainly, you know, this is a great headline really to read from a farmer on Loch Derg. They never touch a lamb. Uh, he's this farmer. He, I, I I met this guy and um, he. I didn't realize uh, over the years he'd been documenting birds and he showed me his whole notebook where he'd been he'd been uh, spotting birds and writing on dates when birds were present and that this is the great guy and the shores of Loch Derg so it's people like that really that are uh, you know help they without community involvement there is you know the the project like this are much more difficult to achieve if not impossible so I guess I wanted to wrap up with, um, if I've still got time, Podrick. Um, yes, with, go ahead. Uh, yeah, with broadening it out a little bit before I finish, because um, uh, I guess I just wanted to, uh, the, we think we're at the crux of, um, you know, probably an important time for the White Tail Sea Eagle project where, where we've had a couple few bad years, but we now have more and more young birds that are likely to join the breeding population. We now have a cohort of new release birds um, that are that within maybe three years could join the breeding population. And that should really consolidate the, 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 the future of the population. Not saying it's out of the woods. You can see still see that there are big issues and things like avian influenza can come from left field, I guess. Um, something that we haven't predict um, and really knock you for six, but you can, the, we, I, I guess we, we've now given it the best chance possible to succeed, but broadening it out, um, the, the, where does white tail eagle, where does the reintroduction fit really in conservation in Ireland and certainly in Europe? Um, we're looking at, you know, a pretty grim scenario as far as birds, you know, you, these, these are, some of the recent, uh, a recent publication on decline of, um, maybe I think it was the loss of 600 million breeding birds in Europe since 1980, a paper published just a couple of months ago um, on many losses of common birds, especially massive decreases in common, common birds across Europe. And we've seen this in Ireland as well. Also the bird life report, one in five bird species threatened with extinction in Europe. Our own recently published, well, this year, um, newly revised red list of birds of high conservation concern. And I've just circled and read some of the birds. Would have been kind of hard uh, to comprehend maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago that some of these birds would be on a red list like meadow pivot, kestrel, swift. Um, and these, you know, the, the suite of breeding waders, which are now, um, pretty much all in serious, some in more serious in trouble than others. We know what curlew is obviously, um, but also lapwing, snipe, dunlin, redshank, really all in, in uh, has serious trouble without conservation action. So really what can we do, you know? Um, are we just plugging, uh, are we just plugging the gaps um, while these, you know, the, the, the scale of, I guess, the decline of these birds is so, it's been so quick and so large. Um, are we just, are we just plugging the gap uh, and are, are we, are, can we turn around, I suppose, and scale up some of these uh, projects like the Curlew Conservation Project? the Corn Creek Life Project, which is a really good to see. Then we're talking about wider countryside, as was the Burn Project, um, some of these EIPs uh, like the, the Bride Project. Um, it would be, you know, a lot of these projects are, are located either they're on, they're either working on single species or 
they're located in in very small areas. Obviously, the burn is a pretty large area, but can we scale these up really to have to really make a real impact and turn the tables on, turn the tide really from a decline to a stability, at least for a lot of these species, else we really, really risk losing them. Um, and another thing I want to finish on, look, uh, I guess there are, there are exciting things happening out there, you know, uh, large scale projects like rewilding projects in Scotland, like Trees for Life, Africa Highlands, you know, um, where they're joining these large areas of cut Caledonian pine forest up and uh, to restore populations of things like the Capricale, you know, which are hugely exciting. Um, it would be really nice to, to see if we could do something like that in Ireland, uh, especially for our native woodland, which are often, uh, you know, in, in, in scraps and isolated little refuges like those haven't produced uh, young young trees for such a long time and they're in dire need of conservation um, and I'm not just talking about you know I'm talking about those areas which are not even recognized sometimes you know they're not in national parks even though we know national parks are already under pressure as well with invasive species and various other things going on you can see um, landscape largely overgrazed um, and these areas here but there is you can see yourself there is huge potential um, for larger landscape projects I think in some of these areas if we can get buy-in from local communities and that that is really really critical um, but like on on the plus side some of this stuff you know the birds have done themselves and this is the they, these are buzzards which you know, 20, 30 years ago, that map looked completely different. They would have been largely confined to the Northeast, maybe in Donegal and, and Wicklow. And this is the uh, bringing Atlas in 2007, 2011. So uh, I, I can't wait for the next breeding Atlas because I think almost every 10 kilometer square in Ireland is going to have buzzard breeding in it by then. Uh, and obviously, they, another good news story has been the colonization or recolonization of great spotted woodpeckers. Um, I, I did see, uh, I think, a tweet from Liam Lysett of the Biodiversity Data Centre uh, showing some of their uh, great spotted woodpecker records just yesterday, I believe. And you can really see the spread of uh, great spotted woodpeckers really right across Ireland. They're breeding County Limerick, um, County Cork now, and uh, a lot of places up, uh, certainly into Monaghan and places like that. So, so that those are really good news stories. And some of the big stories, I guess, and really signs of hope, really, and something we can build on Com uh, common cranes uh, breeding for the first time in maybe over 300 years uh, this year. Marsh harriers breeding again, trying to get a foothold. Um, ospreys uh, have been trying to breed and uh, certainly there are potential for reintroduction with ospreys and I know Golden Eagle Trust are looking into the possibility of that. Um, you know, also, uh, this is taken, I think, from Agriland. Uh, this is a corn bunting reintroduction spoken about. Again, you know, last, last bread on the mullet, but we know there are reintroduction projects happening uh, uh, in, in parts of England uh, for corn bunting, so why not Ireland? Um, and some of the bigger uh, mammals as well, you're talking about beavers in Scotland. I know we, we don't have any um, any evidence of beavers in Ireland, but we've seen from the Scottish project uh, that they've really, really taken off. And these are ecosystem engineers um, and the value of having, having beaver in uh, wetlands is, is hard, to, hard to quantify really, but uh, it, you know, it's it would be amazing to have species like that in Ireland. But uh Capricale, once we, we have those in Ireland, I think it would be, you know, again, a, a kind of an ecosystem project. We'd have to get the habitat right. We really need pine woodland with a with a good uh on the story and, and ground flora, mainly bilberry and things like that, to restore Capricale to Ireland. And this is uh, we're within. Certainly, hopefully within my lifetime, we'll see lynx back in Scotland. 
Um, and some of those, those projects are inspirational and maybe a guide to what we can do here somewhere down the line in Ireland, for sure. Uh, all these projects, I guess, a white legal project certainly couldn't happen without uh, multiple people. And the, I spent four years in the Black Valley in County Kerry. And, um, you know, I had uh, a lot of good friends there and um, I haven't worn the Kerry jersey yet, you know, keeping the Limerick jersey on. But, uh, but uh, you know, good people. And, um, you know, it was it was it was great to live amongst the people down there and it really helped the white illegal project you know that i was living in, in amongst it, what is predominantly sheep farming and you know people are interested in conservation um this is uh, also these sort of ranger rangers in killarney national park this is where we've been satellite tagged in 2018 actually and uh and this is frank mcmahon who was a dco at the time killarney unfortunately frank has since died but frank was really um pivotal person uh, as far as the Eagle project is concerned. Damien Clark, tree climber, ace tree climber. So I get to sit at the bottom of the tree these days. So Damien sends the birds down. So thanks Damien for all your hard work and continued hard work over the years. Uh, Claire Herdman, a, a wildlife ranger in Glengariff. And all these people really uh, made it possible. And then Gold Ingle Trust, National Parks and Wildlife Service, Nina in Norway, uh, Heritage Council and various funders in certainly in Killarney over the years have been really important. And these are some of the people who helped us in Norway and are still good friends. And um, we are, we're still seeing them you know, traveling back and forth to Norway when we can uh, these days. Um, so Thank you very much for listening. And I'm I also I have while we're asking some questions, Paul Rick, I can play some video. Um and maybe um I'll just if you if I'll play some of that just now. Go ahead. So this is um this is a young bird uh in 2010. Uh this is a 2010 release bird. So this is a bird being um feeding on carrion that have been put out for it um this is this is tw the winter 2010 you can see that the river uh this is in the black valley which is completely frozen over um uh, you see fox tracks across the the river and the snow would accumulate on the ice so pretty amazing so there's actually um audio on this so it's quiet at the moment but you'll you will hear some calling eventually so we're going to get some action as this progresses here and so watch out for what happens here so you can see the size difference between the hooded crows great crows and the raven perched up, up there So yeah, yeah, just a young bird flew, another young bird flew in and it joined, it'll join this other bird now in a second. Go back to feed. So they're like great hulking velociraptors when they just sidle up like that. And this is a little bit of video. This is from Nest in Glengareth that uh, Claire got from the uh, Nest Carver. This is a female. This is after breeding. So this is a female fl flying with uh, fish. And wait and see what happens. You can see the 30th of January, 2021 this year. And here comes its chick. This is a chick from this was 2010 chick Suniva, which has got a satellite tag on it. And uh, so she's not shy and uh, kicking mom off the nest. And she does this mantling, holding holding the wings over the prey. And there's no audio on this, but uh, if it was, you'd certainly hear them calling pretty loudly. So it's quite unusual that um, young birds would still be at the nest or coming to the nest. This is, several months after fledging so 
normally you'd be dispersed by now, but she's be, she has been a real home bird, although she's since dispersed up to Mayo and, and returned, and she's now around Killarney National Park. I've got I've got another longer piece of video, but why don't while I might do is stop here, Podrick, and uh, if there are any questions. Yeah, sure. We've we've got a, a, a good few questions, uh, Alan. So whatever you want yourself, you want to show us the video, we can get to the questions afterwards. Okay. I think okay. we're all enjoying. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll do, I'll do it. It's uh, I think it's a couple of minutes long here. You by all means. Um, fire away if there are any questions this is a bit that um crossing the line did you might remember the um eagles return uh series that was on rt uh back some years ago uh so this is some of the footage they filmed at the nest um so but if if there are any questions uh in the meantime i can certainly answer why this is going on Sure. Well, we've we've one question here that that, uh, that that you might be able to to answer while we're watching this, and it's it's really about what the what the fish what the birds are eating, and uh, I suppose we're 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 allowed to call them sea eagles. They seem to be certainly associated with water, um, and there's a question there about you know the the link maybe between the eagles and uh, overfishing, and and whether that is. Uh, uh, having an impact on their on their numbers, or what are they eating, or or is that a a, a limit on on the on, on their feeding? Yeah, it's hard. To, like um, most of our pairs are actually uh, quite a few of our pairs are inland feeders. So when I like the lock deer birds, you know they have abundant fish. So there, there's no evidence really of any overfishing going on in inland waters. Um, interestingly enough, the um, the um, the 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 most recent marine site fishing, which is the Glengareth Nest in um, uh, in West Cork, there there has been issues with food coming into that nest. So there do there does seem to be uh, food issues that do bring in fish, um, and actually they're catching you. They were bringing in quite a few ox. Uh, mini raisable, we think. Um, so it was kind of surprising that they are struggling for food, and uh, and this has been, this was over a couple of different years with a couple of different females because the females have changed hands, and in actually in Glengareth as well, a bit like this site where the female took over and killed the other female. The female is there now in Glengareth. I actually drove drove out the previous female which was made with the male. So, um, so it, uh, but, but we know that, uh, uh, that there were, that they did struggle to bring in food. In fact, um, we actually supplementary fed at the nest or um, the player and, and others that helped down in help, helped feed at the nest um, there uh, earlier on this year. So yeah, it does seem to be an issue going on there um whether it's down to overfishing or other things going on we're not so sure and where they are catching fish do we know what type of fish they're catching yeah they're they're um so i i'll stop it there Podrick. um unless you want me to replay that no um, that's fine yeah you can stop sharing your screen if you want yeah okay um yeah uh, Mainly, um, like in, in the coastal areas, they're feeding a lot of mullets and be really important in, um, you know, they're, they're, they swim in shoals, um, often close to the surface. So they're, uh, they're one of the easier fish to catch um, uh, when they come into shallow waters, you know. Um, and uh, on the lakes, um, you know, they're bringing quite a few pike um which can be pretty sizable you know on the but are obviously abundant on Loch Derg, you know um bream and other things as well some of the coarse fish um but in in i know in um in uh um Dengarif, um one year we had um a chick that died practically on the point of fledging um they were bringing in a lot of dogfish to the nest um, and also brought in um, 
in array as well so yeah so they can bring in a ray you know pretty much what they're opportunistic so yeah very interesting and, and if we ever do get marine protected areas it'll be interesting to see what uh, what that does for the uh, for for the eagles and their and their feeding mm. um can i also ask you alan about the golden eagles uh we don't hear so much about those so uh, do you have any information about how they're doing yeah um the i, I know they the, the 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 population seems to be pretty stable up in Donegal at about maybe three to five pairs, um, and they have been producing some chicks for the last few years. Um, I'm not totally sure now this year whether it was two or three chicks fledged. I think it was two, but um, they have been fledging two or three chicks most years, as far as I'm aware. You know, so so it's at a small level, but you know. Uh, no new birds have been brought in from Scotland for quite some time, you know, so, uh, but um, given how, I guess, small the population is, it, 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 at the same time, it's kind of encouraging that they haven't, you know, that they're hanging on there, you know, and mm. uh, all those, those young, some of those young birds, obviously, the fledged from nests have, have started to breed, so. Uh, there is, I think, there is hope for the for golden eagles there yet. Obviously, the 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 big plus for for whitetail eagles is their ability to fish. Um, that opens up a whole, you know, area. We we know some of those are, uh, along the Shannon, all those big lakes like Corrib, Loch Uh Once they get in there and start to breed, they should really take off. Mm. But uh, we know, you know, the the food in the uplands is just. It's just not good enough, really, to sustain good eagle eagle populations, you know. Mm. Um, so that's really do we know, uh, so, do, do we know anything about the interactions between white-tailed eagles and golden eagles? Do they do they get along? Do they mix? <laughs> yeah, they. I wouldn't say they get along that much. They, uh, the the uh, golden eagle is slightly sm is smaller than the than the white tails, but more aggressive really and uh, we know that that uh, at uh at carcasses where both uh species turn up to feed you know because they both feed and carry in quite a bit that the golden eels are dominant you know um so golden eels back off um so they're they're i wouldn't say the big softies but <laughs> they're uh they're yeah goldies seem to be top dogs in that relationship so they, they kind of they kind of avoid each other. We had one. Uh, we there were there were there was one occasion where we had a bird, a satellite type bird, actually uh, named Fina, that apparently was brought down uh, to the ground by a golden eagle up in Dunning Hall. Uh, it was actually photographed by walkers, which is bizarre. Uh, can you imagine out walking with a group and then an eagle comes crashing through the trees? <laughs> with another eagle <laughs> these guys they took they took a photograph of the bird on the wow. ground we know which bird it was and i know from the satellite tracking this bird but and, uh, and apparently the bird was stunned and it had flown right to an occupied golden eagle territory at the time wow. uh, okay. but it lived to it lived to tell the tale so okay Fascinating. Um, I'll just go to, uh, we'll, we'll give it another few minutes, if that's all right, Alan. Uh, yeah. We'll just have a few questions here for you. Um, Owen uh, is here. Hi, Owen. Uh, people will know Owen from his uh, Irish rainforest uh, Twitter account, which is getting great attention lately. Um, and Owen is asking about your memories about uh, initial misgivings and objections among local farmers to the reintroductions and to what extent these have relaxed. And it's also, it's linked to another question here from Rachel, who has asked, you know, if you were doing all of this again tomorrow, what would you do differently? Yeah, um, that that's a good question. What would we do differently? I yeah, because like uh, I guess when it, when I when uh, taking it back to one of the slides I, I, I had on uh, the criteria basically for reintroduction, and one of those was is the major. Um, is, is the fact that it would have caused the decline of the species or extinction eliminated or reduced? Well, we didn't know. We didn't know what the scale of poisoning was out there until we put birds out there. And we, we you might remember in uh, probably in, more in social media than in the, med the print media, if you like, uh, we came in for quite a lot of flack uh, from certain quarters. You know, why are we putting birds out there to die? 
Um, and we we know we've we had um, at one stage we had an individual approach the Norwegian ambassador um, to say you shouldn't be sending birds to Ireland because they're dying. And the Norwegian ambassador really backed us on that, you know, and said this is a valuable project. We've got to stick with it. And you know, if if Norway had pulled the plug, we that would have been it, you know. And mm. and they might have been justified in doing that because we were losing birds to poisoning and. At that time, up to 2010, you might remember the Greens were in government with um, Fianna Fáil at the time. Uh, John Gormley was the environment minister. And, you know, without that decision to ban poisons in 2010, would we be looking at a, a potentially sustainable population of white illegals now? I don't think so. Um, you know, that was uh, at, at that time, Ireland was one of, I think, only two countries in the whole of the EU that was getting a derogation to use to continue to use poisons, um, which when you look back at it is kind of it's bizarre. Yeah, uh, well, you know, derogation seems to be the way that we implement environmental law a lot of the time. Um, yeah. Uh, so in terms of doing things differently, I mean, I don't know, you, you probably could, in hindsight, you, you might, you wouldn't have foreseen that poisoning uh, impact from, from uh, at the time. Um, I mean, if you, if you were to introduce another bird of prey now or another animal, I mean, do you think we'd be better prepared for it or attitudes would be softer? Um, I, th I think there's a couple of things, I suppose we might have to look at where the birds, we'd have to look at the ecology of the birds, like if you obviously if, you, if you're talking about releasing ospreys, fish eating, they don't spend the winter in Ireland, it would probably be a relatively straightforward project, no poisoning issues, really, you know, you're talking about fish populations, you release them where the good nest sites and the good fish populations, and it should be it should be on to a winner you know the problem comes when you're releasing a bird that's either dependent on upland prey or scavenging you know if it's largely a scavenger we're going to have to sort out the you know any level of poisoning is going to have an impact so uh, you know having said that you know um would we would we have banned the poisons in 2010 or would we have had the impact we had without losing the birds because they really shone a light on it like the poisoning had been going we'd probably been losing lots of other scavenging species probably been losing pine martens to scavenging from poisoning uh, for years but we wouldn't have known that without the the birds having satellite transmitters or radio transmitters and recovering you know those birds dead and you know hit the headlines a it was very tough at the time it was very tough recovering those birds and you know we had to I suppose get get our point across. We didn't. We didn't. We you know largely. The, I guess unlike in some cases, in certainly when you talk about like you know the bird of prey persecution in Northern England or Scotland, driven grass shooting, we weren't large. We weren't really looking at that sort of situation here. It wasn't largely the poisoning was accidental. It was poison that was put out for foxes and crows, but. This, you know, the end result was a dead bird. So we mm. really had to sort out. We saw it was working in partnership really with the farmers to try and turn that around the farming organizations, but it showed it could be done. So I, I suppose, you know, in hindsight, more consultation and maybe having a more uh, farming community on board from day one. Uh, it was very difficult that very, you know, we had things like a public vote, uh, uh, at an IFA meeting in Killarney before the birds came in, a uh, public vote of farmers, and we attended that and uh, talked to that. And, you know, uh, we had to, you know, we endured some tough times there, really, because, you know, the, the it was very much, um, it was a kind of a political football, really. And white illegals were seen as really a bit of a soft touch that, that if we bring down, you know, would be a real, it would there would be a lot of kudos and bringing down the white illegal project you know mm -hmm. and and uh but luckily there were a lot of good people that really backed us and held firm and now i think relationships are good and i suppose maybe the fact that we've turned things around over that long period of time with the farming community we could now build on that for other projects and in 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 into the future you know yeah 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 definitely um 
Uh, there's a question here from Jonathan about, uh, is there any evidence of birds attempting to breed in Northern Ireland and particularly the Loch Erne area? And I'm also looking at your map wondering when do you think we might see uh, sea eagles on the East Coast? Yeah, I'd say it's only a matter of time between before birds breed in Northern Ireland. Um, Upper and Lower Loch Erne have really been a magnet for the birds over the years we've had. There is one satellite tagged bird that I know of up there at the moment, if not two. Um, and um, it, yeah, the um, culture, the one who, who produced that trio of chicks in, uh, she spent two years up there. I fully expected her to stay there. And then just she up sticks and maybe she she was into her fourth year and she decided there's no male showing up so i'm gonna head south again you know but um but yeah it's a, it's probably only a matter of time because the habitat in the the fermanagh lakes is just fantastic you know so um so yeah, yeah it's gonna happen yeah Great. Uh, I mean, I, I think overall, uh, your 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 story really is a, is a hopeful one. It's a, it's a really optimistic one. I mean, it's had kind of ups and downs and roller coaster, but uh, I mean, it shows um, what what we can do really in Ireland and the potential that's there. And Alan, I really want to thank you for your time. And maybe before uh, we sign off for the evening, um, where would you recommend people go to see the Eagles in action? Where are the best places? Yeah, I suppose Glengarriff certainly would be. Glengarriff is pretty much a banker, I would say, for white tail eagles. You know, um, uh, Killarney could be a little bit more problematic. You know, because the in the it's a big landscape. Surprisingly enough, even though your know, lakes aren't that big, but you know the birds have a habit of uh, sitting around for hours on end. They're not necessarily up there flying and cruising about all the time. So you need a lot of patience. Um, yeah, Glengarriff would be good. Um, uh, the the Mount Ch the the Mount Shannon area of Loch Derg would have been very good, but we still, unfortunately, the um, the the male since twenty eighteen, he's still unpaired and he's still there on his own. So, if he does pair up, that that should be a great place to to see white tail eagles. You know. Yeah, yeah, great. I, I remember the last time I was in Glengariff, there was a very cooperative eagle sitting on a rock just as the boat <laughs> went by it out to Garnish Island. It was absolutely amazing uh, views. Um, and I think it's wonderful that, that there is opportunities uh, for people to, to, to see them up close like that. Uh, but Alan, look, once again, thank you so much, uh, not only for tonight, but for your, your wisdom and your dedication over the years in, in seeing through this project. It really is one of the most uh, inspiring uh, conservation stories I think we have uh, in Ireland uh, at a time when we really need a lot, of, uh, a lot more inspiring conservation stories. And I want to thank Thanks. everybody else. We've had a wonderful turnout this evening. And I want to thank you all. For those of you asking, will it be recorded? Yes, it has been recorded and it will be online. For those of you who are interested in rewilding and want to see more of this kind of stuff, uh, we are uh, finalizing the common agricultural policy at the moment. Uh, tomorrow is the deadline for the public consultation. We've been asking our members uh, to send an email to the Department of Agriculture asking that rewilding uh, be included as the options for farmers uh, over the next decade so that we can see more woodland and more uh, healthy bogs and, and rivers and so on. Uh, you'll, you'll find details of that on any of our social media accounts. So if you can, please send that, uh, that email. So that's pretty much it uh, from this evening. Tune in um, in 2022, imagine, uh, when we'll be holding more webinars. So uh, happy Christmas to everybody and enjoy the holidays. And uh, we're looking forward uh, to the new year already. OK, thank you. Good night. Cheers, Patrick.